Hallelujah. All right. Well, let's uh, let's welcome Phil and Vicky Burdett. They are again going to bring the word here tonight. I'm anxious for it. I don't need to do any accolades or anything other than they are our friends and we love them. Welcome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That would be Kadesh, Kadesh, Kadesh. Only, only, only. Kadesh. Hallelujah. I guess um, I would like to take a minute for a testimony before we get into our message tonight. Um, I, I don't know if y'all know where we came from, but we sort of just wandered in. <laughs> we were driving down this road out here and we saw this church and we said, Let's wonder what this church is doing out here. We need to come by here. And, and I believe we should have come early because uh, we missed Steve Francis and we were listening to uh, his uh, teaching this week. And wow, what a message! What a vision for this church and talking about the things and I said well, you know we fit right in here this is amazing and so welcome by you people it is just you know we were just we we're blown away from it. and, and you know, we drove out and of course Vicky would say Vicky says uh, you know after about a week she says this is the church that I saw in my dream and so then we went another week or so and said, hey, you know, I'm not too sure, I'm not totally sure. And she goes, even if it was the church I saw in my dream, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> but uh, wow, we're, we're just so blessed to be here. And we thank the pastor, pastors, uh, for inviting us, let us have a chance here today. I want to give a quick testimony and say how I ended up in this, because it's, it's, it's truly bizarre. I, I, um, I knew all along I was called to ministry. Uh, I knew I was all along I was called to deliverance ministry and actually was practicing deliverance many years ago. And, and you know, it went up and down. Actually, when I first got saved, I had an amazing experience. And I'm not going to bore you with that right now. I mean, it's an exciting story if you ever want to hear it. But um, the thing that's happened is we I went up to a seminar on the liberty and came back and immediately was was teaching this and immediately was laying hands on the sick. And and I just I can I can tell you the test it's amazing. Um, however, I want to tell you the truth that I Vicky and I haven't been married very long. We've only been married a few years. And this ministry that we're in is a deliverance ministry but the the beautiful thing is is i fit right in and it, it's god put me here i mean i can tell you that for a fact i know for a fact god put me here um he wouldn't have chosen me <laughs> he wouldn't have what you would have, you would have chosen me oh well now i don't know <laughs> now you're getting personal <laughs> So thank you all for your welcome here, and thank you so much for having us and allowing us to bring a word in this short period of time. Uh, we are involved in a ministry called Freedom's Way Ministries. We are on the uh, a conference line every morning at 7.15. We read the Bible. We, we go through binding and loosing prayers. We go through prayers of favor, uh, affirmations children's prayer, and then we read the Bible every morning, and there's people from all over the country that join us, so anybody would like to learn that number at any time, we'd be glad to share it with you. Uh, you can just tune in, listen to it, join us in the morning, uh, also Friday nights, we, I mean uh, Monday nights, we do a teaching, which my wife writes, and it's very powerful. She's powerfully anointed. I've been sitting through uh, many of her counseling sessions and joining in because when the anointing's there, the anointing is there. 
and, and, and you speak in it, you get into it, it's, it's easy. You know, it's, it's, you don't have to come up with stuff or, or work anything up. God is there and he's ministering to these people and I'm just sitting there with virtually my mouth wide open seeing how powerful what's moving through this ministry and through the counseling sessions that Dickie's involved in. So again, that would be the introduction. I don't want to take a lot of time with the testimony. If you'd like to hear, hear about it, I'd love to share it with you when you're ready. Um, but today, um, we're going to bring a message, and it, it's so tied in, but the reason I brought up Steve Francis is because what he was saying is, is like, you know, ties in to identity. And, we're, and, and our word today is about identity, uh, and because our ministry is based in identity. Who are we? So I'm going to bring um, Vicki up, and she's going to go over a lot of this, but I'm going to give you kind of a, an overview to get started. Uh, this is going to be exciting. You're going to love this. Um, uh, we're going to tell you, which we're going to tell you is not new. Uh, you've probably heard it before, but we're going to connect a few of the foundational truths in a way that you may have never thought of. And you're going to be excited, and you hopefully you will not leave this meeting the same as you got here. So we're going to start out with who are we? Uh, um, number one, we are created in the image of God. Amen. Everybody knows about that. Right? It's nothing new. We, it's in Genesis. Uh, he created us in his image. Uh, but what does that exactly mean? Uh, in order to know who you are, you must know who God is. The word tells us of his many attributes, but there are three primary attributes of God's nature. First of all, God is love. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, he says, He that loves God, God loves, he that, start over, he that loves not Knows not God, for God is love. I don't think anybody would disagree. God is love. Amen? Again, in 1 John 4 and 16, and we have known and believed that God, the love that God has to us, God is love. And he that dwells in love dwells in God. And God in him. Hallelujah. Again, in one, um, well, the next with the next attribute we're going to talk about is truth. God is truth. John fourteen and six. Jesus says to him, "I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me." Hallelujah. Attribute number three. God is humility. Philippians 2, 7 and 8. But God made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. So this means two things. One, being created in the image of God means you are just as he is. As he is, herein is our love made perfect, 1 John 4 and 17, that we have may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. Second, you, so, so the attributes of God, what do we say? Well, God is love, God is truth, and God is humility. That is your true nature and identity. So if you ever wonder who you are, you are love, you are truth, and you are humility. 
So what happened? <laughs> well, it happened back in the garden. Adam abdicated his responsibility to cover and protect his wife. Now, Vicki's going to explain this part in a way that will make it clear and you will be excited about it. I was so excited to hear the message originally. Um, Satan entered mankind with his nature and tainted the blood of every man born from Adam with his own nature, which is opposite of God. This one uh, I know is a little bit, it's getting a little shaky here, but bear with me because you can't deny it. You can't deny it. Satan brought in fear to Timothy, to Timothy 1 and 7. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Where did it come from? Why are we fearful? If God is, you know, and, and, and most people think if you say, what's the opposite of a love? What would you say? Hey, right? But, but it's not. It's actually fear. Fear. There is no love in fear. Fear brings torment. Satan brought in deception. Speaking to the Pharisees, Jesus said in John 8 and 44, you are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and bowed not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. Wow. Satan brought in pride. That was the very thing that got him thrown out of heaven. Read it for yourself in Isaiah 14. I'm not going to read that right now, but read it for yourself. He, he, he brought in pride, got him thrown out, thrown out of heaven. That's who he is. So who is the devil? He's fear. Where there is, where God is love, he is fear. Where God is truth, he is deception. I think deception is pretty prevalent today in the world. And where there was humility, God is, uh, Satan brought in pride. So I, I think if you battled with anything in your life, it was these things. You know, you, you battled because that spirit, you know, is trying to say, but you know, Satan could not take out our nature. He could not remove it. We are created in the image of God. But Satan came in with his nature and then we so, so we have this conflict going on because we, you know, we have the nature of God. That is who we are. That's our true identity. This other stuff is not. So why are we fearful? Why is there so much deception in the world? And Pride. You know, that's lifelong battle. We have to overcome pride. So, bottom line on this, and Vicki is going to expound on this in an amazing way because it has to do with men and women and 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 our roles, etc. It, it's an exciting teaching that she has, and I'm going to turn it over to her. I'm right the second. <laughs> this also means a couple of things. First, we now have two natures within us. We have the nature of God and the nature of Satan. When Satan gave us his nature, he could not remove who you were created to be, the very image and likeness of God. He could not separate you from you. At your born again experience, you were reconnected to your true nature. One of the things we do in our meetings is we ask people, have you had an encounter with the living God? Have you had an encounter 
can you really put your finger on the where you were changed, where you were filled with that spirit? It is a true change. You know, it's, it, it, you know, and it is our choice which nature to follow. It. And it will be much easier to choose rightly by knowing the old man that you fight daily isn't even you. It isn't even you. You can now separate yourself from that which is not you. Your flesh is actually the mind of the flesh, speaks of. Is actually the carnal nature of Satan. <laughs> the mind of the flesh. This doesn't. This doesn't have a mind here. This doesn't think. You know, this is. You know, it's it's the carnal nature of Satan. Two Corinthians seven and one. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Hallelujah. Well, that's a big bite, so chew carefully. <laughs> Maybe we can come back again sometime and explain this more thoroughly, but now, for now, as promised, I, I'm going to introduce my wife and we'll explain the abdication of Adam's responsibility. Now, um, I did. I started out with something. I never completed it. I'm gonna go back to it. Um, we've been married two years, two and a half years at this point. Uh, this ministry, Freedom's Way Ministries, has been in existence for 20 years or so. Um, my wife's uh, former, or I should say, late husband started it with her and um, that's where the conference line came in and these teachings a lot of it is comes from um, the uh, um, I the health and uh, spiritual, roots of disease. spiritual roots of disease and blocks to healing right spiritual roots to disease and blocks to healing so I've been, uh, I'm a blessed man, and I have moved into a position, and uh, you know my wife is an author as well, so, so many of you are reading her book, hallelujah, thank you. Um, so um, I'm going to turn it over to her. I do want to tell you a, a little bit more about her. Should have left this one out to you before we got started. Um, yeah, there it is. Completed training in spiritual roots to disease and blocks to healing. We've been talking about potentially having a healing night. That would be an amazing thing for this church. This church is called the Great Things. I'm on, I, I'm, when I saw that, uh, the preaching of um, Pastor Fran, uh, Francis, wow. I mean, he, the things that are going to happen here are going to happen. What a what a position it sits in. This church, you people, Hallelujah! We're blessed to be here. Um, anyway, let me uh, go ahead and give you a few uh, qualifications on my wife, and I'm going to turn it over to her so she can expound on this. Because this teaching that you're going to hear most of, mostly tonight was done in, originally in India. Uh, she was told by God to teach this to 150 pastors, and keep in mind, in India, all right? And uh, don't the men and the women sit on the different sides of the... <laughs> they don't at sit. the beginning of the week, yeah. At the beginning of the week, and then they kind of merge together. Yeah. But, uh, so to imagine having a woman get up and teach this to 150 pastors from, uh, uh, let's see... Coimbatore, India, in 2007. Christ Guidance Missions International Theological Institute and Bible College. Um, as you know, Vicki's written several books. 
Um, she's completed training in the spiritual roots of disease and blocks to healing in the Be in Health program. Um, vocational ministry started in 2003 as a deliverance minister and conference teacher. Wrote the firm foundations course using as a um, initiation into a church. Right? Something I want to look into. Um, in India, I told you she uh, preached in, or she taught 150 pastors in the area of deliverance. She's received a Doctor of Divinity degree conferred by the Institute of Theology at the Christ Guidance Mission International in Quimbatore, India. Uh, India. Um, she's written six books and uh, she started this ministry. So, without further ado, here she is, Vicki Burdett. Vicki Smith Burdett. Thank you. It's so important that you know who you are. Thank you, Pastor Mark, for having us here. Uh, I'm excited to bring you this word because it will change your life. Now, as we go along, I am certain I will hear some sacred cows mooing. Uh, but don't worry, as they make good barbecue. And I encourage you all to check me out and what Phil and I have to say. Be Berean. Don't take my word for it. Go to the word and verify that what we are telling you is actually founded and grounded in the word of God. Amen. So, Father God, I just praise you and I thank you for this time and I thank you, Lord. I yield myself to you and I say come and have your way bring this word the way that you would have it brought make it clear I come against every spirit of spiritual deafness or spiritual blindness that would block the understanding God circumcise our ears give us ears to hear you and hearts to understand you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so what you're about to hear um, is from the Lord. And as Phil said, he did give me this message originally in Kumbhatur, India, at this pastor's conference. And he said, uh, this is what I want you to say. And I said, me? <laughs> he said, yes, you're bringing the word today. I said, here <laughs> in this place, because there is de a definite separation of men and women in this part of the world. Um, the men would sit on one side of the church, their wives on the other. And so, you know, hopefully, this message, as it did there, begins to correct a serious identity crisis that we have in the world. If there is a separation in your mind uh, between men and women in authority, in dominion, in the earth, then find Galatians 3.28 and tear that page out of your Bible because it says there is no male or female, no Jew or Greek. We are all one in Christ. Amen. So, um, you know, most of our problems in our society today are kind of centered in this issue of gender crisis. And it, as a result, and you know, I may be stepping on your toes here, it's a result of the failure of God's people to recognize who we are and to correctly align ourselves 
in our roles as men and women of God. So I want to begin by looking at a great untapped resource in the church, generally speaking, not this church, of course. And that is an, an underutilized resource. And that's the spiritual authority of women. And then we're going to look, move from that into what covering looks like. Because men know they're supposed to cover their wives, but they don't know how to do it. And their daughters, and they don't know how to do it. So oh, you'll know when you leave here tonight. Hopefully, we're going to impart to you some truths that are going to set you men free. Going to give you some understanding. And you'll know what to do with that woman. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Okay. These relationship issues, by and large, have not been taught in the church. And maybe they haven't been taught because they haven't been understood. And if they haven't been understood, it's because the devil hates women even more than he hates men. And I'm going to go into that statement a little more completely as I go along and explain what, where that came from and what I mean. But in the beginning, as, G, as um, what's your name again? Phil. <laughs> I told you we hadn't been married long. <laughs> okay, I knew, I knew who you are. Man of God. Phil mentioned in Genesis, um, where we are made in the image of God. I'm going to read that verse to you. It's Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Thank goodness we have dominion over creeps. So God created man in his own image. I'm going on with the scripture. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, you may think you're getting Bible 101, but just hang in here with me because I'm going to show you some. God created man as a complete within himself entity. Male and female created he them. We don't get to Eve till chapter 2. Okay. So, in Genesis chapter well, let's go, let's just say male and female created he them, and he gave them dominion. That was Adam. We're talking about Adam as a them. In chapter 2, God divided the man and created a woman, a man with a womb, a womb of man. That's Genesis 2. Uh, verses 21-22. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. Now, the first thing, ladies... You cannot expect men to understand you because they were asleep when we were created. Just so you know. But let me get as a little bit technical. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna. I'm gonna steal from Dave here now. Um, this word translated as rib in this verse is a combination of two words. One of them means a part. And the other one means rib or curved. And that makes sense. You know your rib cage, right? The root of, of that means 
to curve. So I'm going to suggest that God did not take an actual rib from Adam. He took a part. Now, you know, there's been that lifelong question, well, if God took a rib from Adam, why, did, why isn't there a rib missing from there? Right? Well, this could explain that. The Aramaic language would tell you he took the smallest Part. Now maybe he took this part from Adam's actual rib. We don't know. But it really wouldn't matter where it came from. Because I believe what God took from Adam to form Eve was the female part of his RNA DNA. God divided the DNA molecule took the female part and put it into another body. If you think that's too far out to accept, that's okay. Just, you know, you got to go out on the limb because that's where the fruit is. So if it's, if it's way beyond, ooh, I can't get my head here, just put it on the shelf for now and let the Holy Spirit work it for a while. So, I... Uh, I looked up the Hebrew words that had rib in them. And I was amazed at the results. You know, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to search it out. And I was searching it out. So I took every Hebrew word that had R-I-B in it, and I looked at it. And this is what I found in the meanings. Myriad, that means like a lot. An indefinite large number, 10,000 times 10,000, a descendant of the fourth generation, great, great grandchild, be fruitful, fertile. Each one of these definitions can relate to our DNA. Every single one. First of all, the DNA molecule is curved. And I'm sure y'all know that. I know John does. There you go. See, he knows. He knows. So it's a curved little molecule. It's like a spirally thing. Hallelujah. Yes, like a staircase. So that's the first thing, is it's curved. Then there are a myriad of them. You can't probably count them all. An indefinite large number of DNA molecules in your body. They carry genetic characteristics. So there would be your fourth generation descendant, the great great grandchild. There would be the be fruitful. There would be the fertility. And they carry fertility in both the sexes, male and female. But look at this. The fruit is produced in the woman, the womb man. We're the ones that have the babies. Simple as that. An interesting fact is the scientific name and definition of DNA. And RNA. So I think everybody can see this. But the name of DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. <laughs> I had to check with my, my mentor over here. And it means a nucleic acid forming a principal constituent of the genes and known to play an important role in the genetic action of the chromosomes. You probably won't ever need to know that again. RNA is ribonucleic acid, a nucleic acid of high molecular weight found in the cytoplasm, that's it, okay, and nuclei of cells and associated with DNA in the synthesis of cell proteins. 
Now, I do not find it co I find it amazing. Do, would you say it's coincidental that we find this word rib in, the, in these names, in this scientific name? I don't think it's coincidental. It seems probable that the Lord divided the DNA RNA molecule, took the female part, created a man with a womb, a womb man. Man is not complete without woman. The woman is the one with the reproductive ability. So let's go back to the garden again. The man and the woman are one flesh. Same DNA molecule. The woman was taken out of the man. She was made as a help meet for him. It's the woman's responsibility to assist the man. It's the man's responsibility to cover and protect the woman. Adam didn't do that. Now, he was right there in the garden with her. If you don't believe it, you can read it for yourself. She gave to her husband with her. So he was, he was knowledgeable about what was going on here. And he had the responsibility to say, wait a minute, honey. No. God said we were not to eat of that tree. You see, I think that the serpent went to Eve because she had the word from her husband. She did not have the direct word from God. Adam got the direct word from God before she was ever created. So Eve was more easily deceived. And Adam let her do it. Oh, you guys. <laughs> Sorry. Adam stood by and let Eve eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He did not stop her. He did not protect her. He did not cover her. Now, there is a spiritual application as well as a physical application to this word covering. And there's a spiritual application as well as a physical one in assisting. So our roles and our interactions should, should be more spiritual than they are physical. We are not human beings only. And in fact, we're not even human beings first. We are spirit beings first because we're created, as, as Philip's already said, in the image and likeness of God. So we are, God is a spirit. So we are spirit beings first. We live in a body and we have a soul. So where are we here? We should be more spiritual. We should be more kingdom-like than we are worldly. Amen? Amen? The kingdom is now. Please, if you're waiting for a kingdom to come, just open your eyes and look around. Kingdom of God is within you. It's your job to let it out. You got Jesus in you, let him out. Amen. So when Adam didn't protect and cover Eve spiritually, the whole thing came unglued. Phil's wheels fell off the wagon. The world was turned upside down. They were turned out from God's garden and into the world. And then look what happened. This is God speaking to the serpent in Genesis 3, verse 15. And I, this is God speaking. I know I don't sound much like God, but use your imagination. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your seed and her seed, it shall bruise your head, take your authority, 
you shall bruise his heel. Now, we all know that women don't have seed. Men have seed. So the seed of woman has to be Jesus Christ, who is conceived without seed from a man. But that's not what I want you to see. I want you to look at the first part of this verse. God put enmity between the woman and the devil. That means mutual hatred. That's what that word translates. Women have a deep hatred that is built into us. God put it there. It's a mutual hatred between the woman and Satan. And Satan hates women deeply and completely. God did that. When this hatred for the devil that God put into us women is not properly channeled, there are disastrous results. Help us, Jesus. The devil hates women, and this is the reason that Satan has spent thousands of years training men to oppress women. Now, I know y'all don't do that in this church, and I appreciate it. But you are aware, if you're not aware, I'm making you aware, there is a lot of oppression of women out there, especially in the church. Most particularly in the church. Ever since the garden experience, Satan has trained men to oppress women because of his hatred for us. And this is the reason why women in many parts of the world, even today, are not considered, sometimes not even better than animals. Their possessions, they're not considered worthy of an education. They're not taught the things of God. Women were not permitted to taste of the knowledge of God for centuries and centuries. Not permitted. The Father. Hey, we're talking about Jewish background over here, verifying what I say. They weren't allowed knowledge of them, of him up to uh, probably for a thousand years up to and including Jesus' day the only women in the temple were prostitutes they're the only ones that were allowed in the temple so look at Solomon and his wives these women were not allowed to have a relationship with God you got to keep that in mind they were not allowed to have knowledge of the true God. So what did they do? They turned to other gods in an attempt to fulfill the spiritual reproductive power that God gave us. You've all heard of the biological clock. Well, women also have a spiritual biological clock. We have a deep desire to produce something for God. To, to move in power in the spirit realm. It's ingrained in us. God did that. So they turned to other gods in an attempt to fulfill their spiritual reproductive power. And when they did that, they also turned to Solomon. He loved his wives. Solomon, who for the love of his women, went after Ashtoreth, Milcom, Shemesh, Moloch, various false gods. He was assisting her to fulfill her spiritual power, but he was doing it outside of God. And God warned him. We have a desire to reproduce. This is probably why you find, um, well, I'll get to that later. 
So let's look at 1 Kings 11, verse 3 and 4. This is talking about Solomon. He had 700 wives. How do you keep up with that? Princesses. 300 concubines. Oh my gosh, now we're up to 1,000. And his wives turned away his heart. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father. Huh. When a man oppresses a woman, this is oftentimes the sad result of that. This is what happens. This is how contention in the home begins. You all may not have this problem, but you will come to some people who do. And you need to know this information so that you can help them overcome and come into their true identity. You are not here by accident. You are here to be activated. I believe that. And I believe that is the heart of your pastor. So, when a woman is not allowed to fulfill her call in God, and we all have one, when she is not covered by the man and nurtured by the man in what she was created to do, then that natural hatred that God put in us for the devil is twisted. It's perverted toward God. How many women do you know, ladies? Why wasn't I born a man? Men get all the breaks. And they begin to hate God rather than Satan. And they manifest that hatred toward the men in, in their lives. That hatred is manifested toward the husband, toward the father. No wonder we're in trouble. So now we have a man hater. Inwardly, the woman blames God. And because the man is the earthly image of our invisible God, he gives the brunt of the woman's dissatisfaction in her life. I know you've all heard of Jezebel. And, uh, this is a good description of how she gets started. I want you to understand, though, this, this point is very valuable. There cannot be a Jezebel without an Ahab. Ahab, who was actually more wicked than Jezebel because he abdicated his role. He stepped away, just like Adam did, he stepped away from covering his wife. He let her do the dirty work to take the responsibilities that belong to him. He abdicated his throne and his dominion. So, how does that happen? Are men born Ahabs? No, absolutely not. And Ahab is made because a man is faced with a woman of spiritual strength. And doesn't know what to do about it. So there's confusion. I mean, he knows by the word of God. He's supposed to be the priest in the home. And yet, this woman over here seems to have a direct line to heaven. You know, she's getting words from the Lord. God, why aren't you talking to me? Sets up competition. The reason she's getting words is that mutual enmity gave her a, a crown, a radar. She, Proverbs 31, she's the crown to her husband. She picks up in the spirit a lot more easily or quickly than the man does. As Phil was saying earlier, you know, I got, I got the vision of the church. I didn't even tell you this, Pastor Mark. I dreamed about this church two times. The sanctuary. Saw the doors. Saw the sanctuary. Color of the carpet. Color of the chairs. The whole setup. 
The first time we walked in here, I said, oh, this is the church in the dream. But Phil was like, no, maybe it's not. Maybe we should wait. Maybe we should try out a few more places. Maybe we should, you know. And I appreciate that in him. I do. But this is, this. I'm, I'm giving you a personal example of what God did in the separation of men and women. The world calls it women's intuition. But it is put there by God. So because she seems to be getting the words or hearing from God or whatever it is she's doing, and he's not, then <laughs> he can go one of two ways if he doesn't understand. He might try to out-spiritualize her or make her feel guilty for being closer to God or instill doubt in her about what she is hearing or it, whatever, you know. Guilty for getting a word from the Lord about whether we really should buy this house or whether, we, you know, makes her feel devalued, chips away at her identity because he's trying to fulfill what he thinks his is. And maybe he begins to strive to be like her but then he, he gets disappointed in himself and he goes into self-rejection because he can't be like her. God didn't put that in him. So he gives up, finally. He gives up and he gives in. And then there's ungodly order in the home because the wife makes the spiritual decisions. Whatever you say, honey. Yeah, we'll raise the kids the way you want them. He gives up. He abdicates his authority in the home. It's not because he couldn't have done things differently. It's because he didn't know how to do things differently. And if any of you are in that situation, even in a mild way, Please know, I, you are not an Ahab and a Jezebel. All right, that, that's some serious stuff there. Maybe one day I'll teach on that. But, you know, you can see little signs of it, little signs of the disorder in the home and, and whatever. That's going to change after tonight. Because you will know who you are. Amen. So, I want to give you the progression of the making of a witch. There are real witches out there, by the way. And they are praying against this church all the time. All the time. When there is no outlet in the church for the spiritual reproductive power that God put in the woman, then the woman can be easily led astray by the devil into witchcraft where she can produce the power. This is an area in the kingdom of darkness where a woman can really excel. I'm not suggesting that any of you go do that. It's very destructive. <laughs> I don't believe that. Yeah, don't do it. Just say no. But women, women, not men, had the covens in the cult of Satanism. Women headed it up. Women, not men, are the ones who tap into that spirit realm easily. You can look up any number of cults and false religions. I've got a book about this thick of them. And you're going to see a woman heading them up 
or running the figurehead of a man who is not anything more than a marionette on a string or a servant in her domain. That's, that's what happens. Because man represents God in the earth and Satan trains the men, we're trained by the enemy to oppress the woman, then the woman's hatred of Satan is perverted, that means twisted, it means actually, that word actually means to subvert and overthrow. It's turned from Satan toward God, it manifests toward man, and the woman begins to look to other gods to fulfill her spiritual reproductive power and move in her natural dominion, which God gave both. He gave dominion to mankind. He gave authority to Christians. My authority will override, overcome, overwhelm, and put to flight the dominion of a witch. But you got to be sure of who you are. As you can get really hurt if you're not sure of that authority. They do have dominion. I can come back and explain to you why spells work sometimes. We don't have time for it tonight. But the woman ends up on the wrong side. She ends up moving in the dark side of spirituality. And there is, and many of you can attest to this, there is nothing more wicked than a wicked woman. You had a chance to laugh, but it, you didn't because it's true. <laughs> it's true. So how did she get up there? There wasn't any protection over her. There was no covering. Maybe she was abused by her father, who was supposed to be the reflection of God. Maybe she was neglected, abandoned by her father as a child. Many, many things that Satan puts into motion before we ever have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. They were not in God's plan for you. Don't blame him. Hallelujah. So the spiritual balance in the home is dependent on a proper flow from God the Father to Jesus Christ to the man, to the woman, to the children. That is proper flow. That is godly order. She's the one with the spiritual radar. The woman knows, knows things. We know things. The world calls it women's intuition. Men have the fix-it gene. Women have the feel-it gene. I don't want you to fix me. I just want you to understand me. <laughs> I, you know, if y'all would just realize, God made you with the fix-it gene. And he made the woman with a spiritual depth that will amaze you if you nurture it and bring it forth. The hatred that God gave women for the devil makes us powerful warriors in the spirit realm. A woman will not give up. She will not back down. We are going to press in and we are going to press on and we are going to press through to the victory. Men get tired of I don't know why. I guess it's because God gave us that whatever. <laughs> I hate the devil and I'm going to do some smackdown. But at the same time now, you got to understand the woman is softer in her approach most of the time because she is the weaker vessel. I admit that. Women are not as strong as men. So a woman even as a small little woman uses schemes to achieve her victory. 
This can open the door for spirits of manipulation and control to begin moving in our life and increase as time goes on. Got daddy wrapped around your little finger? Oh, you like that manipulation? It works. Let's see if we can try it on the boyfriend. Let's see if we can try it on the husband. Let's see. Yeah, don't. We have dealt over the years with many women who used spirits of control and manipulation to get what they wanted or what they thought they needed for a long time. Some people for all their lives. And then at one point or another, that spirit of control that you've been using so handily begins to use you. They are not loyal. They're all traitors. And they all hate you. We find a spirit can be useful to us. I, I, I was working with one young man one time, he, and he had this serious spirit of criticism. And I, I said, don't you think that's, you know, God didn't give you that criticism. Oh, I have to have this because, <laughs> truth, I'm in quality control at the bush plant. I have to be critical. <laughs> But people will use these spirits because we find them useful. But when we do, the results can be devastating if we get stuck in that and we begin to think, that's who I am. That's not who you are. Don't ever say, well, God made me this way. God's not through with you. He's not done making you. Hallelujah. You cut him off from moving in your life when you say, this is who I am. Yeah. Don't do that. Oh, help us, Lord. Our agreement with the Spirit can give it a legal right to capture our will. So now we can't use the Spirit. The Spirit uses us. And the result can be very devastating. Mental institutions are full of people given over to spirits that they used for their own purposes. Spirits that finally took them over. And this type of situation almost always begins with ungodly order in the home. That can be corrected when you recognize these truths, when you realize your true identity, and when you realize your role in the, the gender of your life. Adhering to the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Amen? When a woman is properly covered. Now, listen, for those of you who may not have a man in your life, and you may not have, you know, a husband or a father or a brother that's grounded in the Lord, then turn to your pastor and ask him to keep a watch on what you're doing. Turn to some godly person. Maybe it's an uncle. Maybe it's a neighbor. But you need to have that system of checks on your life and on your spirituality so that the devil doesn't take you off in the different direction. When a woman is properly covered, she's happy in her place. She's free to bring forth spiritual fruit. She's free to advance the kingdom of God. When the man loves her and protects her, then she can be used by God to fulfill his purpose, not hers. Not hers. And she can keep the devil under her feet and away from her husband and her children. Without that covering, it's just a matter of time till the whole thing False part. There are a lot of spiritually powerful women in the Bible. God didn't put them in there by accident. He wanted us to learn something. Amen? Yeah. So let's pay attention. Do I have some time here? Yeah. Okay, thank you. In Judges chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, I'll read that to you quickly. And Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. 
She dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel on the Mount Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and called Barak, the son of Abinam, Abinam out of Kadesh Napoli. She said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor and take with you 10,000 men of the children of Napoli and the children of Zebulon? She knew. She picked up in the spirit. I know what God's told you, Barak. Hallelujah. And God continues, and I will draw you to the river Kishon. I will draw to you to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army. Now, Jabin was a mean dude. You can go and read the story. It's awful. With his chariots and his multitude, I will deliver him into your hand. Barak said to her, if you go with me, I'll go. It's right there. If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, then I will not go. This is a king speaking to this woman. Where I, she said, I will surely go with you. Notwithstanding, the journey that you take shall not be for your honor, for the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, a lot of people think that Deborah was talking about herself when she said the hand of a woman, but she wasn't. There are a few very significant things here. First of all, Deborah was a judge over Israel. Consider this. Judges were set up by the wisdom of God. Deborah, hello, was a woman. Go figure. Trusted and set up by God to judge an entire nation. Why is it that some churches don't allow women to sit on the board? Also, Deborah, a woman, was a prophetess. She spoke for God. So why are there churches that prevent women from speaking for God? But in my mind, the most significant thing about Deborah is this. She was a wife. The wife of Lapidoth. She was covered. Now, knowing that Hebrew names are very meaningful, I looked up the meaning of Lapidoth in Strong's Concordance, and you know what it said? The husband of Deborah. <laughs> That's what it said. Now, how would you have been like it if all your name meant was the husband of Diamond? A husband and Patty. <laughs> that would take some humility on your part, wouldn't it? I would think so. So I went to the root word for this man's name, and I discovered this. To shine. A flambeau, a lamp or flame, firebrand, burning lamp, lightning, torch. Now, this what this brought to my mind was the smoking furnace and the burning lamp who were God the Father and the pre-incarnate Jesus who made covenant for Abram. This man, Lapidoth, was a reflection of the Lord. And that's the reason that Deborah could be used by the Lord in such a mighty way. Her husband was not in competition with her in spiritual matters. He was covering her in spiritual matters. Without his covering, I don't think she could have judged or prophesied according to the perfect will of God. She couldn't have had God's heart on the matter. 
without a proper covering, at least not for long. Because Satan would pervert it at the very first opportunity. The covering of a man. You guys are so valuable. You don't even know. The covering of man is absolutely essential to the fulfillment of the woman's calling in God. It's actually more important than her own spirituality. Because without it, her spirituality can be taken off track. Turned from God. What does the scripture call a silly woman? <laughs> we are. It's the man's responsibility to cover and protect, to encourage, to nurture, to guide her into fulfilling what God has put in her for God's purpose and not against it. Think about this. Even kings were directed by Deborah. She spoke to Barak and told him, hey, I know what God said to you. This woman was bold. She not only called the king to come to her, she chastised him. That's bold. This tells me judges had a lot of power. God has never withhold, withheld that from women. Never. This is Old Testament stuff I'm talking here. Kings had, ruler, had rulership over cities. But judges were of the entire nation. Now, Sisera is a picture of the strong man in the spirit. He is a power, a principality that oppresses and afflicts us. And Barak did not want to tangle with him. And that's why he said, if you go, I'll go. I think he recognized Deborah's spiritual power. And Deborah agrees to go, but prophesies that he's not going to get the honor. It's going to go, victory will go to the hand of the woman. Now, the battle ensues, Deborah, as Deborah prophesied, the Lord went before the Israelites and Barak's army. He defeated Sisera's army, but Sisera himself escaped. The strong man is still on the loose. The principality was not taken and destroyed. Instead, he escaped, and he fled to the tent of Jael. So the rest of the story in from verses 17 to 24 in Judges chapter 4. Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber, the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, that's Sisera's boss, and the house of Heber, the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera. And she said to him, Turn in, my Lord. Turn in to me. Fear not. And when he had turned into her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. I'll hide you. I'll take care of him. Don't worry. He said, Give me a little water to drink. I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink. And she covered him up again. Again, he said, stand in the door of the tent. It shall be when any man comes to inquire of you to say, is there a man here? Then you're going to say, no. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a nail of the tent. That's a tent stake. That's, that's not a, what do they call them? Two pin and whatever. It's a tent stake. A nail. Big nail. Took a hammer in her hand, went softly unto him, and smote the nail into his stones. Fastened it into the ground. For he was fast asleep and weary, so he died. And behold, his brought pursued sister of Jael, came out to meet him and said, Come, I'll show you the man that you're looking for. I'll show you the man whom you see. When he came into her tent, behold, Sisera lay dead. A nail was in his temples. So God subdued that day Jabin the king of Canaan before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin the king of Canaan until they had destroyed Jabin the king of Canaan. Thank you, Lord. But notice this. Jael was also a wife. However, her husband is a friend of the enemy. 
Have they ever been there? The word says Jael's husband was at peace with Sisera's boss, Jabin, who was king of Canaan. Hebrew's name means community. The roots of it are society, charmer, enchantment, to join, and specifically by means of spells to fascinate. So this man was definitely a go along, get along kind of guy. He was charming, he was charmed by the world, the ways of the world. And this tells us, even though the man in the home can be following the devil, the woman can still exercise authority over demons. Jael was smart. She exercised wisdom in dealing with the enemy. She saw him coming. She went out to meet him. We're not supposed to be hiding from the enemy. She pretended she would hide him. He asked for water. He gave her, she gave him milk. Put him to sleep. There's some meanings in that that I can't go. I mean, there's just not time to tell you everything. Um, and then she destroyed his authority. She took his headship. And it said, <laughs> now how could she have done that? I believe it's because she was in her proper place. She was in the tent. She was covered. She was in the tent. When a woman is in line with God and covered, she can move in spiritual authority without falling into deception and darkness. When she moves on her own, Apart from her covering, she steps out of alignment with the flow of God and is out of the place where God can use her. This is a strategy in the spirit realm. So we need to understand where the battle is, how it is won. It's won in identity. When we understand, then we know we'll be in our place and we'll be aligned with God in the course of destiny that he has written for us. J.L. wasn't off having coffee with a friend and murmuring about her no good husband. Ouch. She was in the place God needed her to be to destroy the enemy. Covered and ready. All she had to be was there. I think there is a place. It's a place in the spirit. If you are there, you're in your place. Sister wasn't defeated in the natural battle. He was defeated in the heavens. It started with Deborah's intercession and her prophecy. She stood in the gap. She put a demand on the spirit realm. She spoke the word of the Lord. Her word went into the heavens. The angels hearken to the voice of the word of God. And that is where the battle was won. And if you don't believe it, read Judges 5 verse 20. It says this. They fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. That's where the battle is won. But we have a part in it. The angels were ascending, descending, called forth by the prophecy of Deborah to perform the spoken word of God. And Jael was in that same course. She wanted to have a line. You know, our, our angels don't chase us. They have a course. We're supposed to be in our course. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Jael was a virtuous woman, as it says in Proverbs states in uh, Proverbs 31, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Virtuous, I looked that word up. You know what it means? War worthy. A force to be reckoned with. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. We are powerful weapons in the hands of God. But we need the man to keep us in our course. In our course. We have the boldness to call kings to battle. That 
that's in us. We have the wisdom to judge evil. That is in us. The anointing to reproduce is in us. The strength to take out the enemy is in us. But none of that can come forth without the covering. Men, we need you. We need you in your proper place. Hallelujah. I'm going to close. I really am. With, um, I have the gift of continuance, but I'm going to close. <laughs> I'm going to close out with a scripture from the book of Ruth. Boaz here is making a declaration to Ruth. And I just want to encourage all you men, if you have a woman in your life, a wife, Make this declaration. Make it first within your own heart. Then make it before God and make it to your wife. When you do this, when you purpose in your heart to nurture and guide and support the call of God on your wife, you will have that crown. You will have it. The crown has those points like spiritual radar. When the woman is covered and protected, she is free to be a force to be reckoned with in the spirit realm and you can trust her spiritual radar. And this is what Boaz said to Ruth in chapter 3 and verse 11. And now, my daughter, fear not. I will do to you all that you require, for all the city of my people does know that you are a virtuous woman. Hallelujah, Lord. You know, in order to turn this tide of gender confusion and correct this wave of ungodly order in the home, we must start it. We must, as God's people, realize and truly understand our value and the roles that we have in our gender. Men have been made to look like they're inadequate, incompetent, weak. The media, the social culture of the day is bent on tearing down the identity of a man as a man. And unfortunately, a lot of men respond by being mean and aggressive and I'm going to show you I'm a real man. That is not God's idea of a real man. They become aggressive, domineering, and others have that passive aggressive thing. You know? They have. Women have been made to look both exalted and superior by this same culture. And a lot of women have reacted by adopting a false identity. I don't need a man. I don't need a covering. I know what I'm doing. There's some outspoken independence out there that needs to be stomped like a bug. You know, you can see both these concepts are wrong and they are destructive. And playing into the devil's schemes has to stop sometime. It might as well stop now. Amen? So, um, I am going to ask Pastor Phil to seal this word and um, close, up, close it and whatever. Hallelujah. Father, we just... We thank you for this word. We believe, Lord, that this word is from your heart. And I ask that you seal it in our hearts, Lord, that we understand who we are in you and our gender identities, that it, it, it that comes forth from you, Lord. You are so good to us, Lord. We honor you tonight. Father, thank you. 
for allowing your word to go forth. Thank you, Lord, for making it so pointed and so clear that I ask that you seal it in our hearts that we don't forget and that we press into you, Lord, and we take our proper positioning in the spirit realm that we can do mighty exploits. In you, Lord, we can do all things and I know that it is your will that we have your power, your authority on the earth to do your will and mighty exploits that we bear much fruit for the kingdom. Lord, let the fire start here. Let it start here, Lord, and spread like a wildfire so you can return and take your place as you have prophesied. So thank you, Lord, for your word. Seal it in our hearts. Camp your angels around your people, Lord, as we go and come. And keep us, our minds stayed on you and proper authority in you. Thank you, Lord. We give you honor. We give you glory today. And if I can just take one minute, I would like to do the ironic benediction that Aaron, the high priest of Israel, blessed his people, the people of God. I'm standing in front of the people of God. So I would like to bless you with the ironic benediction in Hebrew and then in English. Thank you, Lord. Bless you as you hear. <laughs> Jesus' name. Amen.